That was good. If you all have your Bibles, would you turn to look at James with me tonight, please? Chapter number 3, verse number 1. James chapter 3 and verse 1. James 3, 1, the scripture says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of a fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Amen. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Father, bless this holy word now. In thy name I pray, amen. As been happily, wisely said in the past, the tongue is encased behind a wall of ivory. And then a set of lips. And the reason for that, of course, is because of the potential harm that the tongue can do. I wrote down a few things about the tongue. One of the smallest members of the body, yet one of the most powerful. The only member of the body capable of doing good or bad outside of the body. Think about it for a moment. Your words can be far, far, far removed from where you are. And they can be doing good or bad. Words can heal or words can break. God uses the power of the tongue to communicate the saving gospel of Christ. Satan uses the power of the tongue to deceive and blind. The tongue can be used to call for help for a victim. The tongue can send the helper in the wrong direction. The Lord Jesus Christ was a preacher of the word of God. Moses declared, let my people go. Moses declared, who is on the Lord's side? Christ said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. Christ also said, go and sin no more. The tongue can be used for good or evil. The power of life and death is in the tongue. It is one powerful little member. Ye can yield your tongue as an instrument of righteousness, or you can yield it as an instrument of wickedness or evil. The tongue can be used for good or evil. Tonight, by the grace of God, I'm trying to use the tongue for the grace of God and for good, for righteousness, and to preach the gospel, and to help people. But I could be using this tongue for a lot of other things, no question about it. From that one individual can come forth sweet and bitter, ought not so to be. But the reason for that is because we have a dual nature. You have the old man and the new man. The old man is wicked to this very day. Nothing changed about him. You'll never sanctify him. Nowhere in the word of God does it ever say to sanctify the old man. The old man is still the old man. He's wicked and vile and corrupt and cursed of God. And will go back to the ground from whence he came. But the new man is created anew in Christ Jesus. And the Bible says you're to put on that new man. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This helps in what comes forth from your mouth. For the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So what is coming forth from your mouth? What are you saying? 
When we were kids, we said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never harm me. That's a lie. Words can do you a lot of harm. The fact of the matter is you can break a bone and it'll heal, but you can break a spirit with a word and it may never heal. You can do harm with a word, with your tongue, and with your mouth that people will carry all the days of their life all the way to their grave and never forget it. You can break families apart and you can put them together. You can hurt children. You can bring, you can bring condemnation and woe down upon a child uh, by saying uh, hateful, hard things to it. Or you can comfort that child and try to give it a light in this old dark world that we live in. Your tongue can be used for good or for evil. I want to talk tonight from what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs about a choice tongue. Proverbs chapter number 10 and verse number 20. We're going to quote Proverbs a good bit here. So if you'd like to turn there with me. Proverbs chapter number 10 and verse number 20. The scripture says, The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The tongue, therefore, of an individual born again, a grace of God, one who's living for the Lord, he knows exactly what words to use, how to use them, when to use them. Because a word fitly spoken at the right time is worth an awful lot, folks. Proverbs chapter number 15 and verse number 2. Your Bible says this tonight. The tongue of the wise useth knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. We live in an age which made it a lot easier for the fool to manifest himself. I've never seen the light. With Facebook and Twitter and all the rest of it out there, they call social media. We have people today that will go out and rob something. They'll, they'll, they'll perpetrate, a, perpetrate a crime, video themselves doing it, and upload it. You talk about a fool. And I don't understand how we have become such a foolish nation. But that is the epitome of stupidity and ignorance. It could be that they just simply want to be seen so bad that they're willing to incriminate themselves in doing so. That is ignorance, folks, and God Almighty need to give us more grace than that. The book of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, the Bible said, A fool despiseth his father's instruction, but he that regardeth reproof is prudent. Do you have a father tonight that has tried to instruct you? A father that has tried to instruct you by, first of all, the way he lives, and then what he has said to you, the wisdom he's tried to pour into your heart, scripture that he's quoted to you. Have you, have you had that? Then you ought to thank God for that. I never heard that one day in my life. But if you've had that, you should be thankful for that, for a father like that. Are you a father? Have you tried to instruct like that? Have you lived before your children? The way you, what you preach, you preach it with your life, not your mouth. And your life that you live, if it doesn't back up what you say, they may never say it to your face, but they're thinking in, your, in their heart, you're a hypocrite. And we don't want that, do we? In the book of Proverbs chapter 31 and verse number 26, the Bible says this. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. I think of Abigail in the Old Testament. She was wise. How many remember the story of Abigail? She was married to Nabal, and Nabal was a, he was a herder of sheep. He was essentially a rich man. And uh, David was out in the field with a number of men. He needed food, and he needed provisions. And he sent a spokesman. He sent a forerunner to the home of Nabal and requested some sustenance to help him while he was in the field. And Nabal sent him away in a, in, a, in a foolish rage. And when he did that, of course, he went back to tell David how he'd been treated. And David was ready to go and take his head off for the way he treated him. But Abigail heard about it. And Abigail loaded up figs and provisions and so forth, the Bible says. And she went out to meet David. And she spoke wise words. Here's what she said. She said, I'm married to a fool. <laughs> That's to paraphrase her term. I'm married to a fool. Well, she knew she was married to a fool. She knew it probably for a long time that she was married to a fool. Are you married to a fool? Have you been married to a fool for a long time? Your fool may be a PhD. Your fool may be sitting in a chair at the University of Tennessee. He may be have published papers, read all over the world, and still be a fool. What is a fool? A fool is an individual that refuses to think the way God thinks. He refuses to accept God's revelation of who he is and the eternity where he's headed. And he relies upon his own intelligence and his own ability and his own accomplishments. That's a fool. That's a fool. And so Abigail went and she won David over. And David said, all right, because of what you've said. And he, he, didn't, he didn't go wipe. But what happened to Nabal? Somebody tell me tonight. You've read your Bible. What happened to him? 
He turned to stone for a while, didn't he? Then he died. He had his heart turned to stone when he realized the, 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 when he realized the world he had created by his foolish actions, he was, he, he was brought into a state of panic and fear. And then he died a short time after that. But he had a wife who was a wise woman. That's who we're talking about in Proverbs. A wise individual. You don't always have to tell somebody what they look like and you know, when they look like a fool, when they're acting like a fool. You don't have to tell them that. You don't, have to, you don't always have to, to, uh, to, uh, to pick somebody and, 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 and point out all of their problems and their errors and their faults and all of that. You don't have to do that. Let the Holy Ghost do that. Unless God Almighty gives you a specific reason to do that, unless it has something to do with you personally, you're better off keeping your nose out of somebody else's business. The fool. In the book of uh, Proverbs chapter number 31 and verse number 26, she opened her mouth with wisdom. In her tongue is the law of kindness. In the book of Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 11, we read these words. Philippians 2, 11. Philippians chapter number 2 and verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day you will see Satan confess that Christ is Lord. You'll see it. You'll be a witness to it firsthand. And he will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he won't like it a bit, but he will confess it because it's the truth. And so the Bible says in the Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 11, it says, Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the book of Romans chapter number 14 and verse number 11, the scripture says this, Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. This is a, this is, this is a oath upon his own essence. God says, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Like the billboard said, you're going to die and you're going to face God. And that's coming. That's coming for all of us. In the book, I'm glad God, I'm, I'm, I'm glad Christ faced God for me. Amen. Amen. I thought I'd put that in there for you tonight. He took my place and he faced God in my stead. Psalm 119, for folks, I do not want to stand before that almighty being guilty in my sin. I do not want to be there. Psalm 119 and verse 172, the scripture says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. In a matter, the matter is, the, the fact is, it really doesn't make any difference how you feel. It doesn't matter what the prevailing pop psychology and philosophy of the day is. What does God say in his word? What does the word of God say? Like we are faced right now with this crisis in America over sodomy. What does the word say? What does God say? I don't care what the Supreme Court says or that man in the White House. What does the word of God say? What does it say? What does it say? I read a poll today. I read a poll today. And I don't put a whole lot of stock in some polls, but this one seemed to make sense. And here's what it said. It said that what the Supreme Court has just done in this nation has split America right down the middle. And that a lot of people who were sympathizing or sympathetic towards sodomy have now begun to rethink their position because of the, uh, because of the potential ramifications of what just transpired with the Supreme Court decision. And now they're pulling away from the pro-Sodomite side and they're going over to the other side because they've got enough sense to realize that the Supreme Court is trying to destroy the very moral fiber of this nation. The country has been split right down the middle. Isn't that a shame? And by the way, this week, Obama's going to Kenya. How many know that? And a pastor... And the minister of defense or somebody in Kenya, some high official in Kenya has said, now when you come down here, here's what he said to him. When you come down here, don't come down here preaching your sodomy. Don't come into our country trying to stir up the sodomy and all this other stuff. We don't want it in Kenya. That's pretty good. When's the last time you heard any of our polecat titians talk like that to him? Don't come to Kenya, they said, and bring your perversion with you. We don't want to hear it. That's pretty good. I say amen to Kenya. Huh. 
Hallelujah. I wish we had some of that in this country. In Isaiah chapter number 50 and verse number 4. And so this is the first day of the week. I don't know when he'll be there. Maybe today or tomorrow he's going to be in Kenya. It'd be interesting to see what they're going to do down there. What happens? In Isaiah chapter number 50 and verse 4. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Folks, you realize that. That learning should be a lifelong process? That should be. You should be learning for the rest of your life. Let me tell you something tonight to really help you. The more that you stimulate your brain and use it, the less likely you are to have Alzheimer's. Did you know that? That it is a proven fact that if you will use that brain, you can stave off the effects of Alzheimer's for a long time, if not completely. That's a wonderful thing to know. In plainer words... Take yourself out from in front of the TV where your mind is in a passive state. Pick up a book and start reading it. Engage your mind. Begin to think and, 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 and use analytical thinking. And it will it, it help. That's what the brain's about. It's like, it's, like, it's like exercising your muscles when you think and use your mind. And so when you teach people, the Bible says here that there be not many masters, as I read to you from the book of James, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. You know, I don't take that lightly. I know God's going to hold me accountable for what I've said here at Temple Baptist Church. I've tried my best, folks, to keep you abreast with what's going on. I'm trying to tell you tonight. I'm trying my best to tell you. Sodomy is running wild in this nation, and the Muslims are, the floodgates are open to the Muslims, and Obama is doing everything he can in America to legitimize the Muslim religion, and he wants to add their holy days to our calendar. He's working overtime to do that. In every way possible, that man up there at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is trying to destroy the fabric of America. Amen. And what you're seeing is an acceleration of it because he knows he only has until, uh, what, about 16 months now, whatever it is, left. And he's gone. And so he's going to do more and more and more and more. We need to do some serious praying that God Almighty will limit the destruction that this man will do before he's out of office. Amen. And pray for his soul. Because the Lord knows he needs his soul prayed for like all of us. I do not believe for one second that he has a clue who the Lord is. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. In the book of Romans chapter number 3 and verse number 13, the scripture says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit, and the poison of asp is under their lips. This is a quotation from the Old Testament. Uh, what is a sepulcher? Do you know what that is? That's a grave. What happens in a grave? What happens to the body when you take it out here and you bury it in the ground somewhere? It corrupts. It corrupts. In other words, you're talking about uh, decay and corruption. You're talking about an active, an active degeneration an active corruption, an active decay of what had one been, once been a living thing. That's what a tomb is. That's what a sepulcher is. So therefore, their throat, their mouth, is nothing in the world more than a constant vilification of the righteousness, holiness, what's good, what's right, uh, that has anything to do with God. It is one vile spewing of death and corruption and putrefaction, one right after another. And there are people like that. They're like that. Lord, help me. I don't want a tongue like that. Do you? I don't want a tongue like that. You know, they used to tell me when I was a kid, uh, I think it was a rural high school, they said, listen to this man cuss. Listen to him blaspheme. Listen to him as he just is one oath after another. They said, do you know why he does that? Because he doesn't know how to say anything else. He doesn't have enough of a vo vocabulary to express himself. So he just, he just, he just blasphemes. And you know something? After years and years and years of observing people, I'm going to tell you the truth. I think they were right. He cannot express, he or she cannot, back then women never cussed in public. It didn't happen. If you heard a woman cuss in public when I was in high school, you had a rare event indeed. And nobody would respect her from that day on. Now what went on in private is a different matter, but in public, no sir. No sir, did not happen. 
See, I can't get it. The generation today cannot understand the world I grew up in. It's just so foreign, so different. There's just no way you can connect with what I'm saying. But it did never happen. And yet today, man, I hear women come out with stuff. Their mouth is as red hot as it can be. Some of the filthiest perversion that you ever heard in your life. And it, I mean, it's just flowing like a river in public before people. What's going on? If you destroy the feminine fabric of a nation, you've destroyed the nation. When you take motherhood away and you no longer have that respect that men have for the women and for the mothers, once that's gone, it's gone. It's gone. When I was a kid, there, I knew men who would never utter a foul word in front of a woman. They had too much respect. They wouldn't do it. How many know what the world I'm talking about? Amen. Now what do you hear? It's coming from the women. In 1 John chapter number 3 and verse number 18. 1 John 3, 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Here's another way of saying it. Words are cheap. Words are cheap. Fair weather friends. Oh, how easy the words flow. But there's no heart in it. There's no truth in it. And you know it. Don't listen to the people telling you that they love you and they want to help you and they're your friend and this and that. Watch the ones who come around when you're flat of your back, when you're sick or when your family's breaking up or when you're hurting or when you need somebody to come and help you, pray with you. That's the one who's serious. That's the one who means what they say. James chapter number one and verse number 26, the Bible says this. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Vain. You know something? It's not easy to bridle the tongue. Do you know what turns the tongue loose most of the time? The one thing about a person's life that literally just unleashes the tongue? Anger. 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 People get mad and they'll say things when they're mad that they wouldn't say any other time. They used to tell us when I was a kid, once again, that count to ten. Count to ten before you let loose with your tongue or do what you, uh, what you want to do impulsively. Count to ten. You know what? That works most of the time. That works most of the time. Now, if he's on top of you beating you in the head, it doesn't do any good to count to ten. <laughs> Get him off of you. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, As much as in me is to live peaceably with all men. Seek peace. One of the qualifications of a pastor is that he's not a brawler. <laughs> Do you know what a brawler is? He's a fellow that hangs around cotton-eyed Joes. <laughs> or one of these places around here. And he's constantly fighting over some woman. Or he's fighting over something. Or he's fighting about this. And he's fighting about that. It'd be awful hard if you saw this guy else. Now think about it. Saturday night he's out here at cotton-eyed Joes and he's in a dog fight. And I mean, he's beating up on people and they're beating up on him. The blood's flying. And then Sunday morning, he gets up in the pulpit and he's got, a, he's got his coat on, his tie, and he reads his scripture. Would you want him preaching to you? I wouldn't really care about what he had to say. That's what he's talking about. That's what's going on here. An unbridled tongue. Proverbs chapter number 10, verse number 31. He says this in Proverbs 10, 31. Proverbs 10, 31. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the froward tongue shall be cut out. What's a froward tongue? It's a presumptuous tongue. It's a tongue that assumes things, presumes things, that jumps to conclusions. You ever been guilty of that? I have. Jump to conclusions before you know all the facts. It's quick. To, it's easy to do that. That's a froward tongue. What do you do then, preacher? You bridle it. And you keep it locked in there and listen before you jump into something. Proverbs chapter number 6 and verse number 17 says this. Proverbs six seventeen. You didn't know there's so much in the tongue. Bible about the tongue, did you? A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. 
That's in the context of verse 16. These six things doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to him. And in this list is some pretty rough stuff. Feet, over here it says, and hands that shed innocent blood. Would you classify an abortionist as a hand that sheds innocent blood? I would. Well, then the Bible said God hates them. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven abomination to him. The judgment bar of God is going to be awful hard on the abortionist. But for the man who sheds innocent blood, right before that is a liar. A liar. Isn't that rough? Have you noticed how the news media is so careful to use certain terminology when it comes to the president? How many times did you hear him say that if you like your insurance policy, you can keep your insurance policy? He said that over and over and over and over again. Was that the truth? He knew it when he said it that it wasn't the truth. He knew exactly what would happen when this thing, uh, uh, when this thing was implemented, Obamacare. Now let me go another step further while I'm on Obamacare. If the sorry Republicans had gotten off of their duff and done something about helping people get medical coverage that would have helped them, Obamacare would never have gone in. It is because they drug around and, and pandered to the pharmaceutical industry, to the big wigs, big wigs, wigs making all the money. There's a lot of money to be made in that. And the insurance companies and all of that, they, didn't, they never did anything about it. It's, it's just like the veterans' hospitals. Um, Knoxville, Tennessee should have a veterans' hospital. As big as this town is, it is a shame and disgrace the way they have treated our veterans in this country. I see a bumper sticker that says, if you can read this, thank a teacher. How many agree with that? If you're free to read it, think of veteran. Yeah. Yeah. These boys go over here and get blown up, come back. Some of them don't come back, they come back in a box. They go off to a place that a lot of them come back and they'll never talk about it again because it's such a traumatic thing to them. They go off and fight these foreign wars. I'm not, up here, to, I'm not here tonight to push war. I hate war. I hate it with a passion, but I'm also a pragmatist. And I realize that if America projects a weak image like our president who is weak, if we project a weak image in this country, it's only a matter of time before they'll invade you. They will invade you. Why? We have a lot of natural resources in America that countries would love to have. There are insane liberals in this country that would disarm our military. They would, they would take everything we have to defend ourselves and stockpile it and sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya and believe everybody could love everybody. They are so brainwashed. No, I am a realist. I believe that as long as America has a strong military, along America will have liberty. It takes it to keep the invader out. Absolutely. But when you have it, who pays it? Who pays for that? Who goes out and fights? Who fights and dies? Who sheds their blood? You see what I mean? It's a shame and a disgrace what this nation has done to its veterans. Who did it, preacher? The Republicans and the Democrats. Do you know what would be the best thing for America? If we had a government like Israel... If we had a government like Israel, they have to form a coalition government. What's that mean? They've probably got 20 parties over there, 20 different political parties. They have about three or four who dominate. And they have, they have one who produces a prime minister. But he cannot, he cannot govern the country until he creates a coalition government, which means that he has to pull support from these different parties who will join up with his government 
And by doing that, he gets the voice and the input from all of these other parties who are not big enough to dominate, but they're big enough to have a say in how the, how the government is governed. I think that's a good thing. In America, you got the Democrats and you got the Republicans. You got a two-party system in this country, and it stinks to high heaven. I'm so sick of Republicans, I can't stand it. I've been a Republican all my life, and I'm up to here with Republicans. What have they ever done for you? And the Democrats are demon-possessed and have been for a long time. That's truth. Wouldn't it be nice if they had to form a coalition government and pull in, pull in to that government people who were not Republicans or Democrats and form a government that had the influence and the word and the effectiveness of all of these other areas where you'd have a balanced government for a change in America. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I don't know how I got off on that all that tonight, but I'm telling you that's the truth. It's the truth. Proverbs 28, verse 23. He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. You know what a flattery is? A flatterer is somebody who tells a lie to you. That's a flatterer. Proverbs 25, verse 23 says this. Some people like to be lied to, though. I mean, I say that tonight, but they do. The heaven for height, uh, where am I here? 23, Proverbs 25, 23. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. Backbiters. Hi, brother. How you doing? I love you. I've been praying for you all week long. You wouldn't believe. I had to tell you, God's put you on my heart. I have such a burden for you. And the minute you get away from that, sorry, low down stinking dog, I'll tell you right now. If you only knew what a hypocrite he or she is, and that backbiter begins to spread that backbiting out among people, you got a, you got a bone to pick it. Some people, if you do something to them or say something to them, or they perceive that you've done something or said something, they will carry that for the next 30 to 40 years, and they'll never forgive you. And how in the world you live like this? God, as I've said to you, God has blessed me with a horrible memory. <laughs> That's a blessing. <laughs> My wife can remember every word that was said. And she reminds me of, she reminded me of some stuff today that had gone on 20, 25 or 30 years ago. Uh, God bless her. <laughs> I don't remember anything. And I'm, I love it. I really do. I just a few mountaintops down in the past 30, 40 years. Just if, there's a few instances that stick out that I remember, but for the most part, 90 to 95% of everything that's happened in the last, in the last uh, 30, 40 years, be, this coming month, it'll be 39 years here. All that time, I can't remember squat. I can't even remember a man's name. I called him uh, 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 Moreland this morning. What was it? Uh, Adam, uh, Adam Evans, and he grew up here. <laughs> That's what happens when, uh, you know, it just happens. Your mind, <laughs> you start getting senile. <laughs> I, get up at, I get up in the house and go to the other end of the house to do something, and by the time I get there, I forgot what I went to do. <laughs> How many ever had that to happen? Oh, man, that's bad. That's bad. I'll pick up my phone, somebody call me, and I think, and I've known them for 30, 40 years, I think, who is that? <laughs> that's getting bad. That's getting bad. That happens. You say, it won't happen to me. Just say alone, son. <laughs> Just give it some time. You better believe it. My mind used to be sharp as a razor 30 years ago, but not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. I'm glad for one who takes care of us, though. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Amen, amen, amen. He takes care of us. Amen. He does. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. Look at Matthew chapter number 12, verse 37. Matthew 12, 37. The scripture says, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Boy. Hmm. That's tough stuff, isn't it? And I know nobody in here tonight's guilty of anything like that. I understand that. And I appreciate the fact that I'm in the midst of people like that. 
that don't have any trouble with your tongue, that's good to know. But I'll tell you right now that my tongue needs to be behind, encased behind at least five or six gates and walls. Because every once in a while it likes to come out, boy. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. My tongue. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I remember when I was stationed in Okinawa. I don't know if I told you this or not, but it's been a long. If I had, it's been a long time. I hadn't been in the Marine Corps long. How many know what a first sergeant is? All right, you understand, first sergeant. He's a, he's a company. He's the he's the top enlisted man in the company. First sergeant, and the next step up from first sergeant is sergeant major. And we had a first sergeant, and he good old veteran. I mean, he's good old Marine and all that. You know, I mean, but these guys, my buddies, they said, "Now I'll tell you what you do." Uh, I forget what, what it was I was in there for, but something. But he said, now when you go in there, he said, you go in there and you tell him, I'm going to see the first shirt. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> That's, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, I'm standing before God. I said, I'll do it. And I walked in there and strutted in there, you know, real arrogant like, walked into the office. I need to see the first shirt. He heard me. Oh, boy, he came out of that office. He said, let me tell you something. You come in here right now, and you get right up here in front of me. You stand right there, right there. Boy, I mean, his tone was rough. And he said, who do you think you are calling me a first shirt? You, you little green PFC or whatever I was at the time. He laid into me, boy, and he said, you are, he said, you are restricted to the barracks for the next two weeks or whatever it was. I mean, he skinned me and dressed me down right on the spot. You know what? I never called the first sergeant the first shirt again. And I looked at my buddies that got me into it, and I said, boys, I appreciate that. I really do. Because they knew what it meant. I didn't. I was ignorant, but I learned real fast. Yeah, first shirt. Boy, it made him mad. So what happened? My tongue got me in trouble. And I spent the next two weeks sitting in the barracks at night and couldn't go anywhere because of my tongue. And so I learned a little lesson right then. And I think uh, we need to learn that lesson. Yeah. And he was no doubt a decent man. He probably could have been harder on me, but he restricted me to two weeks in the barracks. He probably could have stuck me in there for 30 days or he could probably could have thrown me in the brig for all I know. But he just, that's all he did. So he was a decent man. He probably considered he's just a stupid young fool at a boot camp. Hadn't been in long enough to know whether he's coming or going. And I'll just do enough to teach him a lesson here. And I'll learn my lesson. Have we learned tonight that this tongue is an unruly evil? Man, it can get us in trouble. Father, I pray that you'd use what I've said, Lord, for the glory of God. In Jesus' sweet holy name I pray. And for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. All right, let's stand up tonight.